Hello, welcome everyone. I finally figured out how un to unmute my audio when uh, screen sharing and recording are on. And with this great achievement, I would like to welcome you to Bare Metal Seek 2023 Quarter One Meetup. It's a new format for us. Uh, please bear with us. Um, we have prepared some exciting stuff for you. And first and foremost, we want you to participate. So it's not going to be just us talking. It will be hopefully also you talking and asking questions, telling about your experience and proposing crazy features. You know, doing all this sort of interactive stuff that we like on face-to-face -face meetups, but face-to-face -face meetups are scarce nowadays. So this is it. And um, I guess the necessary introduction while we still wait for maybe more people to show up. So what a bare metal seek. Uh, I'll read this wonderful paragraph, which I copied from someone else's slides out loud. The scope of the bare metal seek is to promote the development and use of Ironic and other OpenStack bare metal software. This will include marketing efforts like case studies of Ironic cluster industry and academia, supporting integration of Ironic with projects like Airship and the Kubernetes cluster API. Coordinating presentations for industry events, developing documentation tutorials, gathering feedback from the community on usage and feature gaps. Right now, right now is happening. And other broader community facing efforts, again, right now, uh, to encourage the adoption of Ironic as a bare metal management tool. And we probably should add that stuff built on top of Ironic as well. Um, small request if you are not speaking, please mute yourself. Don't make us mute you. It can be rude. So what is happening today? I'm gonna to share some news from the community. Um, then we have two panel discussions. So we'll prepare a few slides, some of us, then we'll ask you things and discuss things, hear your proposals, maybe write down. By the way, maybe, could, maybe somebody, someone could uh, take notes in, in uh, Etherpad or maybe bare metal seek Etherpad. Um, the second, so the first topic will be things you didn't know Ironic can do for you. So stuff beyond what you think Ironic is. Second topic will be scaling bare metal provisioning. And then we hopefully have time for open discussion where we discuss things. Um, the proposed topic is battle stories. So if you have something crazy that Ironic did or did not for you, uh, hopefully not breaking stuff, but that happened in the past too, you'll be welcome. With that, I will tell you very quickly the news from our group. As you can see, we're switching from short monthly meetings to longer quarterly ones. We hope that it will give you uh, more opportunity to interact with that, to learn more, and again, hopefully will help you allocate your time so that you can allocate, so that you allocate two hours once in a quarter rather than you need to allocate one hour every month. We'll see how it works. We'll be looking forward to your feedback. Reach out to any of us, uh, really. Um, and the second news, we, uh, the few of us, uh, namely Jay and, and myself, participate in talk selection for the Open Infra Summit, which is going to happen in June. And of course, I should have written the dates, but I forgot them. The hardware enablement track will have a few very interesting presentations, which I am not going to spoil to you, but they are really great. They cover a broad variety of topics, even things we all agree we don't know much about, and things, of course, we do know much about. So come to Open Infra Summit, or if you cannot come, uh, check out the recordings. I think they're always public. And yeah, see what is in hardware enablement track. We prepared that for you. with love for you. Dimitri, can I just jump in? Sorry. Absolutely. Uh, the, the notifications for the um, like authors should be sent out these minutes. So I checked yesterday. They were like aligned with the with this meeting of the bare metal sick to actually send out the notification of your track if your talk has been accepted and also the schedule will be published i understand at the same time so that should happen any minute now all right so yeah we're gonna learn very soon what exciting stuff we prepared for you and of course other teams just as well now uh for the news from our ecosystem i first give the mic to jay hey yeah so um so we've been working on the Antelope release, um, which one of the things I'll mention is, um, well, first of all, I forgot to put the date of the release in here for one. Uh, it's uh, it's coming in at the end of March. Um, but Antelope is uh, it's the first release we're doing this new naming scheme. So like you might still see Antelope in some of the marketing talk or whatever, but we're going to start referring to them using a time-based uh, 
version numbers. So it's actually going to be 2023.1. So that means that like if you're um if you're consuming this downstream, if you're consuming stable branches, those branches are going to be stable slash 2023.1 once that release is cut. So just a warning in case you've got some system that expects it to only be letters, you got plenty of time to fix it. But uh what is that likely to include? Well, um we're working on getting node sharding support landed in Ironic, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more later about what that means. Uh, for Antelope release for operators, it probably doesn't mean a lot, but it is laying the framework for us to do uh, sort of some extensive scaling around some of our least scalable parts right now. Um, we've made progress toward integrating Ironic Inspector into an existing Ironic service. Um, we did not get that work completed this cycle, so that's going to continue into next cycle. But the end goal there is uh, we're going to get rid of Inspector as a separate service entirely, and Ironic's going to run it all. It's become a core part of our um, of our ecosystem, and it uh, d deserves to be home in the big process instead of uh, relegated to its own. Um, one really cool thing, and this is actually a feature of Ironic that doesn't get talked about enough, is Ironic will happily send you application metrics. Um, it supported doing this via Stats D for a long time, but uh, Stats D is not what the cool kids use for monitoring anymore. Prometheus is the new coolness, and so Julia was nice enough to um, do some work to hook up our application metrics so that now, along with your hardware metrics, they're export. They can be exported via Prometheus using the Ironic Prometheus exporter. That's going to be landing in Antelope. That's really exciting. Um, and honestly, you should hook it up in Antelope so that you can see once we get sharding things in place for our clients in the 2023.2 uh, release, you'll actually have metrics to tell you how much faster your cluster is running. Um, the last one, and, and this is something I only want to mention on here, but uh, I think it's pretty cool, like sort of another hidden feature of Ironic, is uh, we're working on a Metal 3 CI job. Uh, Dimitri is actually, and this is... Uh, this is a really neat thing because it's going to be the first time we're testing end to end our SQLite support in the gate. So you can run Ironic happily against a SQLite database. Works great. Um, and we're going to test it to make sure it keeps working great. That's how Metal 3 runs. It's supported. And uh, I don't think that's a lot. Uh, I don't think a lot of people really consider that because, uh, you know, you always assume you need a big database. But with Ironic, we can uh, we can do it in a file. So. Um, I'm happy. To, I'll be very excited once that CI job gets up and running uh, to make sure we don't break it. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure to point out is we are having another virtual PTG for the Bobcat release. That's going to be March 27th through 31st. We're still working on topics for that. So if you have a particular pain point, something that you know is is causing you issues that you don't hear us ever mention or talk about. Um, you're concerned, you know, feel free to go to that Etherpad and propose a topic about it, um, especially if you're going to be there at the PTG to talk about it, because that's that's what we need. We need that that feedback loop with y'all you knowing what's actually going on. Uh, the Quite frankly, the longer we work upstream, the more separated we can be sometimes from the operations. So if you um, give us that feedback, let us know. We're happy to try to deliver what we can to make Ironic better. And that's it for ironic news for this uh, bare metal sig session. Back to you, Dimitri. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Jay or for any of us? Yeah, folks, it's an interactive session, so feel free to interrupt, ask things, you know, comment on like who would use SQLite in production. You're crazy, but yeah. It's supposed to be productive. It's supposed to be fun. Anyway, uh, a few words uh, from uh, the ecosystem projects. Bifrost. So who knows what Bifrost is? Bifrost is uh, a standalone tool for deployment of Ironic and for deployment using Ironic. It's written mostly in Ansible. It's part of our community deliverables. So it's, it's kind of official thing by Ironic, although we, of course, recognize and appreciate a lot of uh, products that use Ironic and rely on Ironic. So Bifrost this last quarter got support for Ubuntu Jemmy, which is a common topic in OpenStack. Uh, there was a patch to add cl custom cloud init configuration per node in a convenient way. Um, it was some 
pretty interesting rework of uh, of a Pixie configuration, which among other things uh, added support for Pixie, not iPixie boot. So we used to have only iPixie more or less. So Pixie group boot is a thing too. And there is an ongoing effort to support future versions of OpenStack SDK and uh, Ansible collections OpenStack, which are undergoing a huge rework. And we are keeping to, uh, we are adapting to these changes as uh, they happen. Uh, Metacube, yeah, finally, uh, my topic. So we get a, so Metacube, what is Metacube? Uh, yeah, you can pronounce Meta3, but the canonical way is Metacube, really. The three is supposed to be high up, but I cannot do it in Google Docs. Anyway, um, Metacube is a Kubernetes project that uses Ironic for bare metal provisioning. So uh, we provide all the useful Kubernetes stuff, so custom resources, controllers, and all the things you are used to in Kubernetes world that use Ironic uh, under the surface and provide more or less the same bare metal provisioning features and you're used to Ironic, but in a Kubernetes fashion. Um, most of the news this quarter are around usability and uh, you know community building processes. We get a new user guide. The link here is it's temporary home. We're looking into you know placing it uh, somewhere under metalcube.io. But anyway, this user guide it still has some gaps, and you're very welcome to populate these gaps or provide your feedback on them. Uh, we get some refactoring of the deployment scripts to use uh, think called customized components instead of you know. So basically, we, we uh, reduce the number of YAMLs in our repository, which is always good. We establish some former processes like vulnerability reporting, releasing process, versioning, code of conduct, uh, all the things. And we started. We are starting, hopefully, finger crossed, but every, everything seems to be settled. This cycle uh, participating in outreach, which is a internship program for people from underrepresented communities uh, and groups. So hopefully one intern will join us this cycle and we'll see where it leads us in the next cycles. If you are from an underrepresented group or you know people from an underrepresented group who wants to get experience in IT, get into paid internship this summer, reach out. Outreach.org, uh, Metacube will be part of that. OpenStack hopefully as well. Yeah, if you want to mentor, talk to me. I know things. I, I, I know things. Uh, I know I know things. Right. Um, and this was in use. Uh, before we jump into the first panel topic after just 15 minutes of talking, does anyone have any questions or maybe news or announcements or maybe some ecosystem project that I missed? Okay, at the risk that everyone is like like opening a web browser and just checking it, the, the schedule, as I said, for the summit is, is online so you can actually check who's like giving a talk in the hardware measurement track and uh, Dimitri didn't promise too much. There's like awesome talks there, but please stay here. Don't <laughs> move. But the schedule is along. I'll also note that the summit this year is also co-located with the forum. So we will be having some form of in-person ironic discussions at the, at Vancouver as well, if you're going to be there in June, but uh, who knows what we'll be talking about. That seems like it's forever ago from now, but uh, we do have a question. Uh, Kuba was asking, how is Metal3 different from running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack? Right, so Metal3, Metalcube is not about running Kubernetes. It's, it's a Kubernetes component. So it's a thing that runs in Kubernetes that can provision bare metal machines for, for Kubernetes for example, or for any other purposes. And just to give you an idea, so at Red Hat, uh, I'm part of the OpenShift team, we are using Metacube and Indirect Ironic as part of both our installer. So we bootstrap uh, essentially Kubernetes by first in installing a small Kubernetes installation in a VM, then using Ironic there to install uh, three control plane nodes, then using Ironic there in the three control plane nodes to install worker nodes and scale up, scale down as, as, when you need. Or you can um, use this metal cube components for wherever you want to use them. For example, we have people in OpenStack team uh, looking for provisioning for using OpenStack. So OpenStack with control plane and Kubernetes, but uh, provisioning OpenStack, they're not called workers, so they compute nodes using Metal Cubed. So it's not like Kubernetes nodes, they're separate. 
Does that answer your question? Um, but it means if you already have an OpenStack running, your need for Metal Cubed is limited. If you have OpenStack, if you have Ironic, and if you do not want to use Ironic through Kubernetes API, that probably don't have a case for it. I guess the case is a bit different. You have Kubernetes and you want to have bare metal provisioning. And there are several projects for that. Ironic is arguably one of the most major projects. Um, so you can have bare metal provisioning in your Kubernetes. Yeah, it's uh, something we've like been sort of talking about as a vision with some of the people in the core team over the course of, of a while now, since standalone Ironic has been a thing is thinking about uh, Ironic not as an open stack component, but Ironic as an any stack component. If there's a stack that needs bare metal provisioning, I firmly believe there's not tools that are better suited to do that than Ironic, right? We've got years and years of knowledge and experience running on real hardware, fix some bugs around it. And so um, I really like Metal Cubed for that reason of that it's another entry point. So it's sort of like if you're looking at Ironic, from an open stack perspective, then like metal cube doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're looking at uh, old school ironic from a Kubernetes perspective, it doesn't make sense. But the metal cube makes it make sense, right? The oh god, it, it I might have Kubernetes people coming through the Zoom screen on me here, but I almost view it as like Kubernetes is serving the role of like the other open stack components. It's like it's doing the Nova pieces a little bit for that. It's doing the other things like. Sort of buffering that between a Kubernetes API, and I, I'm I'm dumbing it down because I don't know the details. I'm not a Kubernetes expert. I'm an ironic guy, but I always found that as really cool to give people another entry point into ironic. And I mean, from a certain point of view, Bifrost is the same thing, except for using Ansible as the entry point instead of OpenStack or um, or Kubernetes. So like that's that's another thing like to keep an eye on and something we're always looking for suggestions for. If you've ever used another open source tool and meant, and, and just, oh, I, I miss that. I wish this could provision bare metal. Like those are the sort of things we want to hear too, because getting ironic embedded into more ecosystems is going to be good for everyone. Um, and so that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Kubernetes and bare metal. It's, it's all very exciting. This is uh Quite frankly, that that's the confluence of of why I'm, why uh, why my employer is interested in it right now is that getting the bare metal servers and Kubernetes scheduling can give you some pretty cool things. So thanks for all the good work on Metal Three. I don't get to talk about that a lot with you, but uh, but it is really cool and and I enjoy it. And yeah, go talk to go, Scott's talk. Congratulations, that's uh. That was beta tested in the in, in a bare metal sig. So, okay, folks. Any other questions on MetaCube on ecosystem on, on the news? All right. So, the first panel topic. Um, the format will be as follows. So, a couple of us have prepared slides, and so we're talking. We're gonna talk about our experience with Ironic just to bootstrap the discussion. Then, things you didn't know Ironic can do for you. We hope. We discover something cool you're doing with Ironic that's just more than just a pixie provision or writing QCAL images. But I also want to hear your crazy ideas what Ironic could do for you. And we cannot promise to implement all of them, but we, we can promise to hear. So group therapy, you know. <laughs> uh, I guess the starting person is me again with my MetaCubed. So what cool stuff are you using? Virtual media deploy. Um, I honestly, I, I I already treat it as a boring thing, like everyone does it. And then I think Julia came to me and asked, "Do you know if a lot of people are using this?" And I'm like, "Wow, different words." So yeah, virtual media is a boring thing for us. Uh, probably not so boring for most of you. It works by connecting the, a CD image to the BMC directly, so by HTTP request, instead of going through all the business with Pixie booting, right? The HTTP server, which returns specific uh, options, and then you know, use the FTP to download the image, then you know, blah, blah, blah. All it is gone. You have a CD image with everything. If you tell the BMC to boot it, boom, that's your RAM disk. It's done. It reboots in instance. That's all. People in my world are very excited about that. So excited that uh, they actually uh, only use that. Many of them. 
Um, cool thing about that, you can do deployments without DHCP. You can embed your network configuration in the CD image, and that's it really, right? It can have static IP, static routes, and you don't need any DHCP. You definitely don't need L2 connectivity because there's no, again, you can have local DHCP, you can have no DHCP, stuff like this. Yeah, if you have any questions, just interrupt me really, or I don't know if, if you can raise a hand here and zoom. Um, yes. How, how do you do the virtual media deploy? And is it also something that will come to uh, Ironic? That's a feature of Ironic. All I'm talking about here are features of Ironic. It's not like specific features on MetaCubed. And MetaCubed doesn't really have bare metal features on its own. It's just a wrapper around Ironic. It presents it as a Kubernetes API. So anything I'm talking here is available in Ironic to one extent or the other. So that's Ironic feature. This, uh, it manifests as boot interfaces. So uh, there's, for example, boot, a boot interface called uh, God, Redfish Virtual Media. There is also I love virtual media, RMC virtual media, I drag virtual media, I, I assume. I drag uses Redfish actually. Or oh, maybe a couple more. So it's more vendor specific than APMI that I need to tell you. But we see an increasing number of hardware that supports Redfish and supports virtual media through Redfish. Uh, so you enroll your node with a compatible server using this boot interface, for example, you have driver equals Redfish and you have boot interface equal Redfish virtual media. And you provide an ISO or you can provide kernel RAM disk as you used to. And Ironic will build a small ISO out of your kernel RAM disk and connect it. Everything else is the same. That's the same deployment, just no pixie is gonna happen between you and the node. That clear or less? Yes, thank you. Cool. So. Virtual media, play with that. It's pretty cool. Again, in my world, it's dominating the, the things. Uh, we use feature code adoption. Uh, that means if you have an already deployed node, what I mean, like you have a server that is already running a operating system in your software, and you just want to manage it through Ironic, you can make it active right away without redeploying. Um, is it useful? Yeah, it's very useful for us because the way we work First, uh, we when we as I mentioned we bootstrap Kubernetes by having first MetaCubed in a virtual machine and then real MetaCubed on the control plane. So we migrate control plane nodes from this VM to control plane. So we enroll control plane in itself using adoption because of obviously we cannot reprovision them because that's the nodes that are running Kubernetes. Uh, we also do the same on upgrade. Um, because the default mode of operation in MetaCubed, and it can be different depending on how you install it. But by default, we upgrade and we do it in OpenShift 2 by just doing down pods and starting it from scratch. So we use adoption to make hosts that are already active in Kubernetes database or also active in, in the running database. Um, without that, we would have to persist the database, which we did not want to do. You may do that depending on how you use MetaCube, but we don't. Yeah, questions here? I have a okay. question. Uh, Is there yeah, support? Go ahead. Um, so like, let's say someone wanted to do like a side grade into Metal 3. I've already got an Ironic that's mostly standalone. Like, is there is there any starting point for Metal 3 that isn't Metal 3? Or is it more or less you have to start you know, Metal 3 is your Ironic. So the question essentially, can you use external or Ironic? Yes. You can have Ironic install somewhere. Yes, but the but is we have a bit opinionated about what Ironic can and can do. For example, we don't support uh, Keystone authentication. We may, contributions welcome, but there may be some assumptions. Some of them may be a bit poorly documented, but yes, that's absolutely a supported feature. And MetalCubed upstream is pretty agnostic. In OpenShift, we are dictating how things should be running, but that's a thing about OpenShift. Are there, do y'all know of many MetalCube users outside of OpenShift? Like how much trailblazing would it be if you went outside of those guardrails? Um, so where, MetaCube community consists mostly of two two biggest contributors are Red Hat and Ericsson. 
I apologize if it's called a bit differently officially, but essentially, that's it. So what they do, they're definitely not using OpenShift. We have a few adopters, uh, it's actually an adopters file in MetaCube docs. Um, uh, it's used Deutsche Telekom, it's used by IKEA, and a few others. I'm pretty sure they're not using OpenShift. And we sometimes see people who are doing heavy customization of Ironic for their MetaCube deployments including up to writing drivers, I think. So oh, there will be some trailblazing, uh, definitely, but it's not like a crazy case and nobody ever tried. It's absolutely things people do. Thank you. All right. Um, something Jerry already mentioned, uh, our, we use Ironic in an all-in-one mode with SQLite. So all-in-one mode, it's a thing that I added a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago. It's essentially Ironic API and Ironic conductor in one process. So a bit contrary to what traditional OpenStack is doing, where they have API, all APIs grouped together and then they have conductors, engines, whatever you call them, Nova Compute somewhere separately. We benefit from just having one process called Ironic uh, because we want it to be lightweight appliance. We use SQLite by default. MetalCube upstream supports MariaDB. In OpenShift, we don't do that because everything is ephemeral for us. We we currently turn off RPC completely because it's single process, but we want to go multi-conductor, multi-process in this sense. And there are some problems with that I'm going to talk about in the scaling section, but we are looking into that. Yeah, as I mentioned, our, the database is ephemeral. So it's rebuilt on startup, both starts a new database, and then MetalCube companies orchestrate rebuilding stuff if needed. Eventual consistency will have it, right? And the, the last, no, that's actually, that's actually not the last, I have a whole another slide. Uh, secure boot management, it's feature of some drivers in uh, Ironic. Uh, Redfish support that, ILO, if you ask us, RMC, I think too. Uh, you can tell Ironic to turn secure boot mode on before rebooting into instance and turn it back off before rebooting into RAM disk. So on tear down, for example. Just very handy, you make sure your instances run with secure boot, but it, for example, doesn't get in the way of Pixie, which does not really like secure boot, depending on how you exactly configure it. With grub, maybe, with IPXC hard. Yeah, this, this feature has been in the Ronnie code base for a long time, but uh, I haven't heard a lot of people using it, so it's cool to mention. Do I need to talk about what secure boot mode is, or do we assume? Nobody screaming yes so go, go for it. Um so some stuff, uh, not an advertisement, but some stuff we do specifically in OpenShift with MetaCube and Ironic that upstream MetaCube uh supports, but maybe doesn't acti actively use. So we use RAM disk images per node. Most of normal people will have kernel RAM disk once downloaded from Turbo, so it's open their fork and you know use them. We build images on the fly. So we take a CD, uh, and Core CDs have a uh, special region where you can insert things. So uh, we serve that. So we have a HTTP server written in Go that serves this image, but inserts your custom information into this area, into ISO. Or on the other hand, we need RAMFS. For those who don't know, need RAMFS images can be concatenated. So again, we serve base in each RAMFS and then concatenate an archive to a CPI or archive to that with customization. So that's how you end up with RAM disk images per node that are heavily customized but not duplicated anywhere. This is this is what's old is new again, isn't it? Isn't this the way the original IPA image was made? With um core OS back when it was core OS, we dropped stuff in the OEM dir. And that was even pre-ignition. That was Core OS Cloud in it. So it's sort of strange. I feel like I'm in Bizarro land. It's like, wait, I did that 10 years ago, but y'all are doing it on the fly. That is that is super cool and exciting. And uh, that actually, honestly, that's one of the secret best features of Core OS that no one thinks about is the the support for the OEM inject stuff. Like that's, that's really good. And uh, it greatly amuses me that that metal cube has gone this direction as well. Yeah, that's specific in OpenShift feature. So I'm a bit, like, you can do it metal cubed, of course, and as a whole OpenShift open source, so you can just I take mean, it and use it. But. You can do that with anything, right? Like I would say like, 
you're you're saying this is like an open shift feature, but I'll say in my experience operating ironic at multiple different places, many of them that were scaled up very high had their own bespoke processes for building RAM disks, had their own policies around what they wanted inside of them. In some cases, even did a different distribution or something. So I don't think this is um I don't view this as like you're not advertising metal shift. You're talking about like the specific deployment decisions they made and most of these mirror pretty closely the same type of decisions that folks who do it themselves are making. Right. Yeah, so I'm highlighting that's a cool thing. In Ironic, you can have RAM disk images per node, or you have you can since recently have kernel parameters per node so for Pixie, so which is also used. Um what else? We since quite recently have heavy users of custom deploy steps. So deploy steps are a way to split the deployment process into uh, small units with the ability of customizing them per driver and per RAM disk and to request uh, certain deploy steps to be turned on and off during deployment. So we use Ironic Python agent as everyone else, but we don't use the default image writing process, so writing QCOW or any images. Or we have a custom deploy step that calls CoreOS installer, which is a CLI that comes with any CoreOS image. And that it stores CoreOS from this image. So if you boot from ISO, you have everything in this ISO that is needed. Uh, so you just can just install this ISO onto the disk without downloading any other images. So that, that's a pretty cool, cool property of that. And use custom deploy steps for it. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's part of our RAM disk image building process, essentially these this, this custom deploy steps. Um, because we, we use Ironic Python engine containerized. So we have a container with it with this deploy steps embedded and we have chorus images that download this container and start up and you know, I think Jay is having some memories again. <laughs> this is this is on metal. Like honestly, like you're describing a lot of the things like you put all metal in a box with a Kubernetes face. And it just it I I've been I've been kind of ignorant some of what's been happening with Metal 3 and stuff. This is all this is very exciting to me. I'm having a great time. Great. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, so custom deploy steps are very powerful. And as I said, you can complement the deployment procedure with your own steps, or you can replace the deployment procedure with your own steps. And that's what we do. Uh, of ironic components, we only use uh, UFI slash bootloader installation. Um, actually, only UFI bits. We don't use legacy bits. We nearly never use legacy boot, by the way. We mostly, like nearly 100% UFI. And the last but not the least, we, for one of the products built on top of our stuff, we use currently Ramdisk Deploy because they have their own installer, essentially, to put it shortly. Um, and so again, everything works as usual in Ironic, but uh, instead of normal deployment, we just put their installer and it does a job. It's pretty cool. It's a bit like a side pass from MetalCube perspective, but uh, it's an interesting way to see how Ironic uh, and MetaCubed can be integrated with stuff that is not aware of Ironic or MetaCubed. And I, I'm aware of at least one person who is not affiliated with Red Hat. He did the same thing. They essentially they used, it was before we supported Chorus installer. So they built their own thing using Ramdisk deploys. I think you boot a Chorus Ramdisk and somehow automated calling Chorus installer. So that's pretty cool. Even if you have an installer, but completely agnostic, you can use that. Any questions, comments, good memories? I mean, I'll also say, if you're deploying this and you're struggling with any of these things, don't be afraid to come into IRC and ask about it. We've all done it before. Swapping these stories is lots of fun. We know where a lot of the dragons are. Um, so, like, don't be shy. If you're trying to do some of these more advanced ironic things where you have to do sort of a little bit of custom development on your own to make them work, Come, come ask if you're having trouble. Ask on the list, ask in IRC. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, the mic goes to Anna. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. So I will zoom out a little bit for like from, from hardcore, very specific um, features that you use Ironic for. 
uh, to like more the operation side of things. Um, so we're still in the section of things that you uh, did not imagine you could do with Ironic. And um, when we started with Ironic, something like five, six years ago now, um, we of course used it for the like prime use case, which was like to install machines. So this is why it's called Beyond Pixie Installation. So this is what we started with. And then we explored the whole like metal management, bare metal management universe of all the things you could do with Ironic. And, and this graph basically shows all the steps that we have when we handle physical machines. And I put a, the Ironic icon wherever Ironic is involved now. So we basically moved the whole management of bare metal into Ironic. So when we started um, a couple of years ago, it was only the uh, the, the provisioning, really. So the uh, like ins installation of, of physical machines. Uh, and all the rest was done with custom tools that we have built here and for our deployment. And over time, we realized that actually Ironic is so flexible and the various frameworks that you have, for instance, the cleaning framework is so flexible that you can basically hook into various things uh, that we were doing with our custom scripts. Um, and this way we could, uh, like moving into Ironic, we moved a lot of the stuff and our experience upstream into the tools uh, that are now also, now also used by, by other deployments. So going through this graph, it basically shows the, the path like bare metal takes in our deployment from the initial registration. So it's basically when you like switch on a node, it basically registers with all the various da databases, specifically Ironic. So the moment a node boots up, it basically gets served the, the Ironic image, does an initial introspection and sends the data back into Ironic. And then there are hooks in order to like treat this data in order to use it in order to register the node with the various databases that we have. Um, there is an initial health check that uh, actually does uh, an inspection. So the inspection data is actually not only going to Ironic, it's also going to um, an S3 backend. And there's like other tooling that actually extracts this and then analyzes this in order to see if the, the service that we got is actually are actually compliant with what we ordered. Um, afterwards, the nodes are like burned in in order to like create additional or initial failures. Uh, you may, re may remember this bathtub curve. Um, all of this like CPU, memory, disk, networking tests is something that uh, we've put upstream. Um, CPU, RAM, and disk is relatively straightforward. And networking is a little bit more tricky because you need two partners that actually talk to each other, but it's, they also then like um, using a, a Zookeeper backend, for instance, can find partners and then they stress test the, the network interfaces. Um, this is mostly also to afterwards verify that you can actually transfer as much as you like for it, as much as advertised through these NICs. Um, we benchmark the nodes with Ironic. So uh, we have very, because we, basically buy at the sweet spot of performance per uh, dollar, if you like. Um, so for us, it's very important that we verify once we, we got the service that actually are as performance as we liked. And um, the benchmarking is something that is also driven by Ironic. So the Ironic cleaning framework is used for this as well. Um, there's various steps where the nodes are configured, for instance, for software aid, something that we also contributed upstream. Um, then the provisioning, of course, this is uh, like the you know the, the initial use case for Ironic as a as a provisioning driver in, in Nova, uh, and now through Nova, and this of course we still use. Then there's adopt step. So the adoption is okay. It's a little bit or slightly misleading because Ironic has an adoption, but uh, what I meant here is like adopting nodes into Ironic and Nova. So that means we adopted in production nodes while they were being used into the system, and afterwards they're fully managed by Ironic. So this was mostly to drive the adoption of Ironic to manage our, our bare metal fleet. Uh, and then there are repairs because we have thousands of nodes and they break um, all it is all, all the time there's something broken. We need something that the repair team, which is the team intervening, replacing this or memory modules can actually use um, easily in order to move the nodes out of production, flag them in the various systems as, as being in maintenance at the moment. Uh, so the support that Ironic has for this like the maintenance mode is something that we that we leveraged as well. And in the end, there's uh, retirement, which is um, some of the nodes that we have will actually not be thrown away after we use them, but they're usually quite good enough to like donate them. And the retirement step is basically to a re burn in. So we verify that the nodes that we actually donate are not broken, but are still uh, performant, just have the 
have reached their, their end of life here at CERN. So, so all of this is basically um, managed through Ironic now. And we moved in the past couple of years, everything that we had done locally into Ironic, into, into mostly into the cleaning framework, into the various images. So this is true for x86, for instance, but we also recently added ARM nodes. So it works the, the very same for, for ARM nodes. Um, and this is how we manage bare metal now. Do you use rescue mode? No, rescue mode is not something that we that we use. What well, one thing that is missing here, I, I see that Scott is also still on a call. Um, something that we were discussing is what, what's something that's missing, and it's like the only or one of the very few things that we still do outside of a running is GPU benchmarking at the moment. So there, like we're looking into how to do this with Ironic as well. Okay, any further questions on this one? Well, I think me and uh, and Sand started talking at the same time. I might have scared them away, sorry about that. I was just gonna ask like, in terms of timeline, like I know you've been involved in OpenStack and Ironic for a while. I'm curious how many um, black and white bears we had on this graph when you got started at CERN. Like, can can we maybe talk a little bit about the journey as well as, you know, where you're at now? Um, you, you mean in terms of the bears? So actually this this graph <laughs> I updated for this presentation. There were so when we started, there was nothing. So we started like OpenStack in 2012, 2013, very early on. We started, of course, with the core comp components. Ironic came relatively late. Um, I think Matthias was also on the call or was he was he was actually there when we when we started with Ironic. So this must be uh, like around 2017, maybe. And then the the I think uh, 2016, sorry. 20, 2016 even. Yeah, um, summer 2016 we started. Okay. Um so it's it's relatively it, it came relatively late. Um and the provisioning was the first one we worked on, and that took took us quite a while, and we were mostly focused on this. And then more and more we expanded. So uh um I, I don't re actually remember the exact order. Registration is one of the last things that we added, like auto registration is probably one of the last things beforehand we were registering mo notes mostly by hand. Um, repair was relatively early as well because um, mm -hmm. Irani had already like built in support for this, like the maintenance mode that we leverage in our various toolings that we have. And then we relatively, quickly added rate support because uh, software rate is something that we use widely. And this was actually also, also my first, I think, major contribution to the to the code base. It was uh, quite welcome. It was very nice. It was a very nice experience at the time when we contributed to this. It was integrated. There was lots of uh, uptake of, the, uh, of this. And equally for benchmarking, which is like more recently, uh, it's something that, that people use. And I get um, questions about how to use it or how, how that works. I think that's also quite heavily used. I'm not sure if anyone ever used the adoption that we did. Um, so the adoption that would add things also into Nova, which is a little bit tricky, um, which we needed to do because we could not like just delete or reinstall the whole fleet. So we, you will see probably one of the later slides, you will see, I will come back to the adoption. Uh, you will see how steeply the number of nodes within Ironic uh, rose at the time when we did adoption because I mass adopted these nodes uh, because we were trying to be very aggressive on moving everything to one system. Um, but I'm not sure if someone has ever tried this uh, in addition to us. We have a blog post detailing how to do this, but it's a little bit more intricate because you have to basically trick Nova into believing it's installing a machine while it is not in order to get all the entries in the database right. So, so Arnie, like Yes. that's used by a large amount of people that might be oh, yeah? a uh that's actually interesting because it's sort of i had no idea you didn't know i've worked multiple places that used certain style adoption like swapping ah. out fake drivers to get things booted into I've... nova instance like that was used very very extensively at one place i've worked and similar patterns were used at other places i've worked so ah, like, i was totally unaware I, I think that's a that's a significant problem and it sort of is uh the nice thing that's like demonstrative of the fact that like uh i think we would love 
if Nova would support something like that natively, but we don't necessarily have the the ability to to go change Nova's model. So that's kind of why it can be interesting to get ironic with different entry points because you kind of have different sets of trade-offs because I would wonder what, like, you know, maybe the adoption story is better for Metal Cube because Kubernetes handles that sort of stuff as a first-class thing better. It's just, it's interesting to see the sort of trade-offs you make when you put different software around Ironic. Mm -hmm. But that's very good to know, actually, because, like, uh, you know, like, this is exactly what we do with the blog post, for instance, for, like, summarize what we did so that other people, like, can can move along this just as we move along blog posts that we find for specific tasks uh to hear that's actually helpful and used somewhere else is great i didn't know so i've seen on more than one occasion in my past open stack days customers deleting their whole over cloud and then repairing it because cleaning was disabled using a similar process even before your blog post came to life so <laughs> that's maybe yeah. not like a positive example but it's definitely right. been happening in my experience it's also not that we invented this from from a to z right we also build on top of uh like various bits and pieces here and there um i mean fake drivers we didn't write the fake drivers they were there for some other purpose but uh we put together like various recipes in order to like have an a to z like okay i have a node that's an installed node that's completely outside of openstack and ironic and i end up with a node that's completely controlled by openstack nova and ironic um but there were various bits and pieces that we took from others as well so okay i'm basically good thank you slide, yeah at this point I want to open the floor and hear about people's cases, ideas, experiences, maybe just fun story where it's something you want to do, something you need. I have a question. Has anyone um, made it possible to use the graphical console of hardware and give it to the end user, especially in an open stack case? I think that's another one where the answer varies based on the hardware you're using. I think we haven't implemented the base interface yet. So there are patches in certain state of readiness which implement that, but we haven't merged that. Yeah, I'm looking for it right now. I'll make sure it gets linked in the chat. Would it be instead of the serial console or would it even be possible to use both? Honestly, the specs are in progress. The code's in progress. You might could uh, could influence that with a review. I think the thing oh, we agreed on was to use BOSS. Perfect. That will make my colleague happy. Yeah, I'll note. I'll note that it looks like right now that the only hardware support for that landing is, is for Dell Drac, and the patch involved has minus ones on it that hasn't been. Uh, responded to since November. So don't get too excited, but uh, it's in progress. It just may take a while. Yeah, I was also, I mean, want to like manage expectations because this is like a recurring issue. Uh, well, a recurring issue, a recurring request, but it's, it's not that easy to do. Um, then there have been various attempts in the past. There was various co-patches that were put up by different people that never like materialize into something that is like like widely used but i agree it, it's a very interesting and very useful or would be a very useful feature um my hope was that with redfish that would become a lot easier but actually no <laughs> not a lot easier at least uh, we had one board uh, one specific type of hardware where actually um the redfish the, the bmc via Redfish would provide you with a like one-time URL that would open a graphical console. Um, that is already like pretty cool compared to everything else that I had seen so far. So you basically could use this then in order to, for instance, embed this into Horizon and you just have a link that you click and it opens the HTML5 page directly to the, to the console. Uh, but I have seen this only on one type of, of hardware. I tried to like do this with, with Redfish for some time, but uh, it never got anywhere. So, but yeah, again, it, it would be really, really nice to have this access to graphical console.
Actually, my teammate is working on this task uh, with Nova community and with Ironic community, as I remember, and he has a good progress. So uh, I think it uh, it's possible that this feature will be implemented in uh, Bobcat or maybe next release. That would be awesome. Yes, the implementation that we can found uh, in community was made for iDrug driver and uh, it replaces serial console. And the implementation that we are working on it uh, uses uh, Blueprint, uh, which uh, allows uh, both uh, serial and graphical console to work. So I think the good answer is we need to wait, <laughs> but not for a long. Uh, can I ask a question uh, about rescue mode, uh, which was asked to Ernie? So uh, does anyone actually use rescue or some kind of uh, hardware inspection where the node fails? What everybody do, because we have a lot of ironic nodes and we have no good process for node replacement or fixing, which is provisioned for our client. Uh, so uh, MJ, I'm one of the people who originally wrote Rescue. <laughs> so uh, we, I haven't used it in a long time, but when we built it, we actually got it working to a point where we exposed it to customers. And the primary use case that was targeted for the idea of a rescue mode in Ironic was a non-privileged way for a user to recover their server. So for instance, if you've got untrusted people who have some access to your Ironic APIs or, or servers, like in our case, we were literally you know, a public cloud, um, Rescue gives you an opportunity to, in case of a um, of like a disk failure, to let someone boot up, recover what they can, and, or even in, in in case of a configuration failure, failing a boot, let someone get in there and do it. And and it's a lot more onerous than using a console, which is sort of the reason why I don't think it's you know one of the most popular features, but it's a lot more secure than using a console. And so that's like that's sort of the use case that. I, I used it for that I've seen it used for, um, but you can do all sorts of fun things with rescue mode, uh, including putting like lots of useful tools inside the rescue RAM disk you're configuring it to boot. So um, any sort of manual offline thing you needed to do with a provision node, you could absolutely use rescue mode as a method to do that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that sort of is is the use case that was targeted when that was written because I feel like console mode is maybe better suited for an actual like administrator or operator type of person to go and fix a broken server rather than using uh, rescue. But rescue is public safe. Sounds cool. Jay, uh, one more question. Uh, our hardware team uh, wanted uh, to run mem test from this uh, rescue image. And as I know, uh, the mem test uh, is uh, like separate process which cannot be run from the uh, already booted uh, operation system. Do you do the mem test uh, in your rescue image? Oh, that's a that's a good like. I don't think it so. Uh, let's let let's let's uh let's scope here. There are a couple of different types of memory testing utilities, good ones and bad ones. The good ones are typically the ones that take over immediately from the bootloader and test RAM. As far as I know, and that's not saying much, I don't know a lot about this, but as far as I know, those processes don't do anything to communicate status back. So I don't think there's any sort of hook for Ironic to use to automate that or to allow our customers to automate, or users to operate that. Um, that's sad. Now there are um, lower quality memory testing tools which run inside a pre-existing OS. You could absolutely run those in rescue mode. You could automate those to run as a deploy or a, um, or a cleaning step, or maybe someday over the rainbow an active step. Um, and in fact, I would say if if that's something that you desire, if you find a tool that you're comfortable with with that. Um, the work that uh, Arnie and CERN have done on burn-in is very much in the same category, right? Like, because it's, it's all just trying to figure out something to fail. So 
um, depending on what your actual goal is with a mem test, like if your goal is get a confirmed failure of a dim to RMA, I don't think the hook exists for ironic to automate that for you today. Um, it, it sounds really cool. Honestly, you might've nerd stiped me. So, you know, if I still remember this come the weekend, maybe I'll go poke around mem test, but, uh, but you can do stuff that you can do inside an OS, which memory testing is just not always one of those that are that are that great. So sort of yes, sort of no, but maybe that helps you with the borders on what we're dealing with. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of so, thinking about the uh, Pixie boot uh, menu modification for these purposes. Yeah, so this is a Pixie image for mem, mem test. They even publish it in boot a Pixie org. Now, I'm not sure it's easy to bend Ironic to boot a random iPixie image instead of a kernel RAM disk pair. If you have someone sitting at the system. Or console. And, and yeah, if you have someone at the console, you can edit the iPixie template. That's a <laughs> configuration file. The iPixie template we use as a config file. So it's if it's possible to do a menu in iPixie, you can definitely implement it in Ironic. But I don't know the resolution to that. Yeah, I'm. I, it seems like it 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 would be possible-ish, but I don't I don't really know. It would actually be a fun thing. Let me put it this way: if you do that, do a talk about it or a presentation at a next sig, because that's that'd be super cool, actually. But your idea of using rescue to do that is not the worst one necessarily, because you could still call rescue boot the node. I think you'll end up in rescue fail but you should be able to take it from rescue fail back to active. So like, I think there is a way to hack rescue mode to be a memory test, but it's going to be ugly and your way out of it is likely going to have to um, include switching from a rescue fail unless, oh no, okay, okay, it's possible. I've done something like this before in a previous job. You're going to have to do the callback to Ironic inside the iPixie if you want to do it in rescue mode. You would have to have some. You'd have to have an iPixie thing in rescue mode that did the following: that curled ironic with credentials. Um, so you know how comfy do you feel about that? Curled ironic with credentials to say this node that I'm booting is now rescuing. So it like does the rescue callback, and then you would boot the mem test. And the only way to abort the mem test would be a hard unrescue from the ironic API. I do not recommend you take these steps. This is insecure, it is breaky, but it is possible. And believe me when I say, if you did an insecure, breaky, but possible thing with Ironic, you would certainly not be the first installation to do such a thing. So the the tools are there. Um, that's actually, that's a that's a that's an interesting use case, I think. The idea of like almost like temporarily booting something into the RAM disk driver. You maybe could come up with a way to do this as well using something similar to that Nova adoption workflow, except for swapping out your drivers for a RAM disk driver and reprovisioning your machine on the RAM disk driver as long as you've got cleaning disabled. Like there's lots of ways to like backdoor yourself into this. None of them are going to be squeaky clean with Ironic. And I think you'll end up with a better solution if you go the route of like the Harbor Burn-In stuff that CERN has. But uh, but that's interesting. And that's a fun little game of like ironic ops code golf to figure out how to do some weird thing that ironic doesn't quite support. But we certainly have the automation primitives to, to do so. Yeah, a bit tangentially, but we should probably, I mean, a, a crazy idea is to support rescue through booting to UFI console. And then connecting through IPMI serial console to it. Well, that is that's not rescue at that point necessarily. Rescue is we boot a RAM disk. Very like like rescue is cleaning without any cleaning because it just boots the RAM disk. When the RAM disk boots, it does the callback to get the network flipped and change the network config away from DHCP, and then it uh you just stay there. Like from there. You could rescue the node and then go in via the console and do console things. But like, I don't understand how we can make rescue mode work without that callback to confirm that something's been booted there. It's like that's- no, I'm, a, I'm in a hacky hacky territory still because it's exciting. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, 
if you get into UFI console, you can probably even run mem test or booted mem test from somewhere. So that may be an interesting possibility to research if you can get there. So I have a quick question, and it's about the uh, tenant networking. Uh, we run mostly uh, OVN in our infrastructure, and we, for sure, you, um, we do not have access or you, we do not want to touch the switches for the whole tenant network. Um, is there, was there ever, ever one in talk with the Neutron guys about running the networking stuff uh, on top of a, of a DPU inside a server? So like you have an OVN controller running on a, like a, the, basically the network card, which has its own image and uh, runs a whatever ARM-based um, uh, distro, and then basically just passes through the VXLAN Geneve-based uh, network it receives um, to the physical node. Was there ever uh, consideration about that? Because that would enable you to like run OVN as your network backend and have like your virtual machines in the same network as your physical machines, like treat your server as like a cattle uh, in this case. Um, was there ever thoughts about this? Um, I just see we are, we are just thinking about this because we are receiving some of these DPUs now. And this is one of the use cases we want to test. It. So that's why I'm just asking. So, so if I, if Dimitri and Arnie don't mind, I'm going to pull the curtain back a little bit on our hardware enablement track chair meeting. Go for it. Where <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> approximately 4 million talks proposed on DPUs. And the majority of our meeting time was spent discussing what the heck a DPU is. <laughs> so like, this is not a technology we're overly familiar with in general. Um, Quite frankly, you'll find that a lot of times it's the, uh, you get the cool hardware before the open source developers do. <laughs> um, uh, I strongly recommend you make your way to the OpenStack Summit. Um, there are a large number of interested people. I know we accepted a talk on that specifically for the hardware enablement track. And I believe there were talks in other tracks related to DPUs. So, like, I, I hate to give you a non-answer, but the reality is, is that you're talking about tech that's so new, we're not super familiar with it. Like, the primitives sound familiar in terms of, like, it seems like maybe they're stuffing some of the software logic into the card itself, which is exciting given the limitations that I've seen with the older school stuff like we used at Rackspace. But um, we don't have the answer for you. And the reality is we hadn't even thought about it at all until... Oh, we have. Uh, huh? We actually, so if, if we, what we're discussing is essentially smart nicks, we actually have code to support that in Ironic. That being said, there's not much support on the Ironic side. We just, you know, some there's some state wrangling around it. So smart nicks are essentially what you describe. And Mellanox was running around several years ago making contributions to all OpenStack projects, mostly Neutron, but also Ironic to make that happen. Um, well, I, maybe a good starting point for you would be to look for some resources that Mellanox created. They probably have some blueprints against Neutron, uh, probably something against Nova. They have some code in Ironic, but that's not like complicated code. We just make sure we do state transitions at the right time, not to break the smart nicks, because I think to program them, it has to be powered on or powered off. So there's some complexity. You cannot reprogram them in some states, so Ironic takes that into account. And you have to mark ports as is smart nick true. So the place to go for you is Neutron, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's I, probably that's, where the magic is happening. Yeah, so, so to the first question, yes, I will be uh, on the summit. And I hopefully have a, a little bit of talks with some people about it. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, I have people who are basically responsible for doing like the connectivity side. And they are already in talks with the Neutron guys. Um, so. I second that as well. So from an ironic perspective, um, it doesn't basically, it doesn't care if it uses two physical interfaces or like just a physical function. Um, but I need to second that it's not a smart NIC because a smart NIC runs fully on the OS itself. In a DPU case, at least the machines we get, there is basically the OS abstracted. That this thing has an own OS. And that's the next thing, which I not even thought about is, you also need to provision this thing with like an Ubuntu ARM to even run stuff on top of that. So that's also a whole nother story, which I did not cover yet. And it uh, gives me nightmares uh, currently because they have like dedicated BMCs, dedicated OS on top of them. So that's a whole, a whole nother zoo of stuff where you kind of uh, need to manage. But 
currently we're just thinking about like having like an, a, a neutral component running on that thing and then pass it through. And I guess as long as Ironic can boot into RAM disk and communicate with the conductor and whatsoever, I guess it should not be a big change about that. But um, yeah, and yeah, it's the new, the new stuff, but I also just received them, I think last week. So I just had a quick look at them um, and this will be a very interesting topic. topic. Yeah. So, so there's um, also interesting ideas about um, so the, the, the storage guys then came up with the next ideas. Um, if we just enable those things uh, like uh, your, your DPU, you can even like do um, NVMe over fabric and then pass it through as a PCIe device from the NIC to the host system. Um, so there is crazy ideas in the room. Um, but let's see. Uh, let's keep it, uh, get it running first in the next few months at all. So, Thanks for the answer, Stoffer. So I'll say two things. First of all, um, I nominate Samuel as the official Ironic and Bare Metal SIG ambassador to the DPU delegation. It sounds like you understand a lot more about this um, than I do, at least right now. So, like, please do go find out about what exists in Mellanox. Go to the stuff at the summit and uh, and cycle that feedback back into us because because we can't know everything. And uh, it sounds like you've already got a head start. So that is uh, greatly appreciated. Yeah, sure, sure, we can do that. The right, other yeah, thing is that good... uh, it, I think back to some of the conversations when Ironic was started, and the sort of composable hardware stuff you sort of start to get into at the end of that is definitely um, that's definitely in line with some of the original visions for Ironic. I don't know. Um, I don't think we do the composable bits today, but that gets exciting because you actually get to to treat bare metal even more like VMs, which is just going to make us interact with OpenStack bits better. If I could actually say provision me an eight core machine with 16 gigs of RAM and it gets the RAM and the disk and stuff from over the network, that's that's super cool. So... Yeah, but I think that is one even even one thing further apart about like this this segregation stuff. Uh, this is another layer I did not cover yet, and I think there's also nothing usable there yet. Currently, I think the the, the first uh, um, like uh, disposable thing is the network you want to run. So basically, what you said, you treat your bare metal server as a VM, which would be already a, a huge benefit to us uh, and mostly to people, I guess, who want to do it. Um, and I think, to be honest, that idea isn't new. I think um, AWS uh, and, uh, already does it with their Nitro cards. And I think that's where all the other Nick vendors got their ideas from. Um, and now I hope just with the DPUs now, it's just more broadly accessible to everyone. Uh, so I think the approach is pretty cool to segregate everything away uh, and just isolate the VM into the, 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 the tenant network. But yeah, I'm not sure about the memory stuff and the CPU stuff about this uh, composable stuff later, but yeah. I would have another question uh, from a colleague um, regarding IPA. Um, it requires an ingoing, uh, an incoming and an outgoing um, connection. And he wanted to ask if it would be possible to use WebSockets on Ironic API and Ironic in, um, Inspector. Uh, conductor side instead. What's the virtue of that? Um, in our case, I think the issue is that we need like uh, routable IPs, and these are limited because who needs IP for six? So uh, we wouldn't need to care about these if we could use swap circuits. If I understand it correctly, which I don't guarantee. No, no, no. That no, your your answer makes a lot of sense. So you don't want to have to have a route back to the agents. Yes. Um, so I wrote a patch downstream for Yahoo. I think it might be upstream somewhere, um, some version of it, which I called heartbeatless IPA. And I tried to spec it out for upstream and it didn't work too well. The the main issue with what you describe is that. It's not actually ironic in our current model that begins the transaction with the agent. When the agent boots, the agent like checks in to ironic via an API endpoint we call lookup, and then it heartbeats. Heartbeats a terrible name for it, but that's what we call it. 
Um, and so it's sort of like the agent is actually the, the thing that's driving everything. So in order to change that, in order to support something where uh, the API goes first, you've got to change some significant stuff about our model. Um, the idea of using WebSockets is absolutely a new one that I hadn't thought of before. It might be safer. Like when I implemented that downstream, I literally basically asyncified everything and used the node object as my ugly cache dumping ground. And uh, it wasn't very pretty, and it certainly wouldn't scale up to people who had extremely complex sets of steps um, simply because you'd run out of space in the database field. Um, so that's not... That, that sounds cool, um, but there are... Uh, sort of along the lines of what Arnie said about uh, about video console, about VNC console, this is one of those topics that's been tackled by people in the community two or three separate times, and it just never quite gets there because the technical difficulty of it is pretty high. The churn in Ironic is pretty high, and the value is limited based on who, you know, environmental concerns, right? Like, I think you're not the only operator and Yahoo's not the only operator who's had that kind of problem, but it's not something that's like easy to rally support around, you know, like let's, let's support this thing we already have again better. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to find that no conductor to IPA spec that exists, which is essentially the feature you're asking for, not in the way you asked for it. Um, I would not necessarily expect that spec to move unless you move it. Um, if that's something that you care about and you're concerned about, this is a perfect, perfect case for going and taking that spec link um, and putting up something on our Bobcat PTG about it. Um, but admittedly, we've got very limited resources to do development stuff. So, you know, you can ask. We love it when people ask. Um, but don't be surprised if, if it takes a while or if the answer is, is no at first. But I'll make sure that uh, existing... Um, spec review gets linked in there but to put that in perspective the spec was last updated um two years ago so that is that's how long it's been since uh since this has really been looked at and considered but uh oh, sorry Jay. i think we already mixed up two cases pretty heavily so hard bit less apa is the opposite thing from no conductor to apa communication you mentioned boss in one in one conversation. That's a bit. Oh, oh, you're exactly right. Hold on. You're right. This is the reverse. So, if what we need is to prevent ironic from talking to agents, which is what I, how I understood the initial request, that is significantly simpler. That does not require rethinking ironic. It just requires us to provide a list of commands in response to heartbeats. That's it. So for now, heartbeats have no response on the status code. If you provide a list of commands in response of heartbeats. Here we go. That's that's how you make sure that only agents talk to Ironic. If you want to remove agents talking to Ironic, that's where things become ugly because of A lookup, B inspection. So which one are we talking about in the end? That's a good question. Uh, um, the, the colleague wanted to get rid of incoming connections on the IPA agent. So on the IPA. So no ironic talking to IPA, only IPA talking to ironic, right? Yes. So that's simpler. That, that's pretty doable. We just need somebody to sit down and do that. That's what I did at Yahoo for what it's worth, to be clear. Mm -hmm. Like I know I switched around when I was talking about the spec at Yahoo. What I did was the um, the agent connecting back to the conductor for everything rather than the conductor connecting into the agent for everything. Okay, thanks. That sounds great. I'll take a look into the spec and give it to the colleague. Um, one last question of mine um, regarding cleaning. Um, I know we probably all wanted Redfish to be this cool thing that is stand that standardizes everything, like IPMI wanted to do it before. And at least in in our case, we noticed. Oh yeah, um, everyone does it differently. Um, but now uh, we are looking. Um, we are still mostly using the IPMI driver, and we're now looking to either switch to Redfish or the uh, vendor ones. And the question is, most of the newer vendor one drivers seem to all use their Redfish implementation. 
So if we um, define our own step, our own cleaning step that is based on Redfish, how will it, how can it know when it runs? Because if they all use Redfish, can it differentiate it? It's, this is a Dell node and it should only run if it's on a Dell node. Does my question make sense? It sounds like you need to define your own hardware type, which is something you still have, you anyway have to do because that's how the composition works. And you use that only for nodes that can run this step. I mean, let's also, let's also, that is, that's the most ironic proper answer. The most operationally simple answer is that you have access to the node object in those cleaning steps you're running. And if statements are great. Um, we did that quite a bit when we first implemented cleaning downstream is we basically would put a tag in node extra saying um, what class of hardware it was and basically look for that tag when deciding what cleaning steps to run. Um, and we did it that way specifically so that we could also say like, okay, if this is tagged as hardware type A, and we know hardware type A is supposed to have 16 gigs of RAM and it's only got eight gigs of RAM, we can flag that as an error in cleaning. So like there, there are some benefits to going that route. Um, like Dimitri said, there's there's real stuff you can do with hardware types and subclassing it out and all that. Um, quite frankly, if this is code that's going to be written by operators and maintained by operators, I might would suggest going the simpler route of just um, inspecting the node object and skipping that step inside the step if it's not the right hardware to do it. And that is a, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically suggesting you hack up your thing. So, you know, Dimitri might disagree with me here, but I'm saying if I was the one making that decision, that's probably the route I would go just, uh, just to, just so someone doesn't need a PhD in ironic to understand what's going on in your cleaning. Right, so I just wanted to know, I don't disagree that I want to notice that our Redfish implementation already caches the vendor as in node properties. So if you want to write logic based on that, it's already there. We take it from the systems manufacturer field. And the vendor drivers and the vendor cleaning steps have this already included. I haven't looked at the code in detail, so I don't know. Maybe it's written in there, but that was one question of us. So if we just use the vendor provided steps, how will the how will it make sure that the Dell steps doesn't run on a Lenovo node? Say they, they implement this already. They're not. They expect it to run the right hardware type. So if you use driver equals Redfish, you only get the generic stuff that is supposed to work everywhere. If you have driver equals iDrag Redfish or ILO, ILO 5, um, it will assume you are right. It will assume it's talking to HP machine, for example. There's no checks there. There's some a bit of logic in iDrag Redfish because of their closeness, but generally you have to be right there. But is there something specific that you want to do in, in a cleaning step? that is not provided by these drivers? So, so what's the actual use case is my question. Um, well, we, we uh, for, for one case, we have um, hardware that is, for example, not, not provided or not supported by NVMe CLI. So we need to, um, so we can't secure wipe it and we don't want to wait for, for shredding. Um, so we probably want to, um, to do like the um, vendor vendor provided tool to to do this stuff, uh, and the other step is we are now in progress of uh, right now we have a, well what we call a block and the block is like between twelve and eighteen bare metal nodes that uh, are con connected to a single conductor. Um, that was how we did it uh, in the past, and now we are in at least one, one uh, some regions so big. Uh, so above uh, a thousand instances that we want to um, to scale better because it doesn't really scale if you have a conductor for less than 20, 20 nodes. And now we are getting into the question, okay, if we want to now also switch to, to uh, vendor provided drivers, um, would it work or should we, or would we need to like make a conductor per, per vendor? Right now we have it because each block is the same hardware, apart from maybe 
like uh, some have more more CPU or more RAM, but it's all the same vendor. And if we now mix it all together, is it a problem for us or won't, will it work? Maybe I misunderstand, but the, the like the driver is per node, right? It's not per, it's not on the control plane, it's not on the conductor. So you have like, you, you can mix on the single conductor, you can mix multiple hardware types. I'm not sure if this is. Yeah, yeah that, that, that I know. Um, but the question is, if all drivers use the same like um, protocol to talk to to the nodes, and that is Redfish, do the drivers still understand that it's not a generic Redfish driver, but they can like um, identify, okay, I'm using Redfish, but I'm still using the HPE driver or the Lenovo driver. And I assume yes, but I just wanted to make sure if I have the possibility to ask so many people here. So uh, drivers for nodes are your input, your as an entity that creates nodes. So you create a node, you use driver equals LO5. You are making a statement that this is HP node. And you can have, then you can create a node that uses driver equals Redfish and you are stating that this is generic Redfish node, which can be Lenovo or you know many of them, even HP itself. And you will get only the subset of features that is available for all of them. So I, I, I may be also misunderstanding the question, but I don't see a problem as long as you provide this input correctly. That sounds promising. I think we will need to look into it more. Thank you. Right, well, while we're talking about Redfish, and let me just add that I, I was just checking and we're running a little bit more of a thousand nodes with, with Redfish, the generic Redfish driver. And it's actually working for the, the, the standard stuff. It's working fine. So we don't do like any sophisticated hardware specific things with Redfish, but like the, the usual instantiation, all the things that I described in this fancy plot that I had earlier, they work with, with the generic driver from what we from, from what I see. So just, just like make a statement from our side that Redfish, the Redfish support in Ironic is actually working for the basic things from what we see quite well. And we have it in production on more than a thousand nodes. Just this was basically as a reply to the comment that, and the fact that different vendors implement uh, their own thing. And okay, we also hit this, of course, their own thing when, when it comes to the Redfish implementation on the BMC. Uh, and we've submitted a couple of patches to handle this. And there's some very, Dimitri was already nodding this, like some very specific cases where they actually like violate some, some standards and there's some pretty funny cases, but in general, it, it, it works. Uh, yeah, I would hope that it does. Um, we were thinking about using um, vendor provided drivers to have uh, access to the extra features like um, deploy with uh, a virtual disk. Um, instead of PXE. Virtual media standard. You don't have to go with the drivers for that. At least in, Red, in Redfish, it's standard. If your hardware supports it in a standard way, the generic Redfish driver will do that. You just have oh, to really? pick a different boot interface. So instead of boot interface IPX, you have to pick boot interface Redfish virtual media. That's what we do on many vendors. And as Arna said, sometimes there are issues. We fix them in Ironic for you so that you don't have to bother with that. The primary thing uh, to be aware of, and no one said this, and we talked about vMedia boot a few times, the reason why most operators choose not to use vMedia is it does require that your BMCs have access to, um, to whatever's hosting your agent. And so in some places, that sort of crosses the security boundary in a bad way. So like, I'm just going to call that out as like, you know, if you're watching this video or maybe, you know, you specifically are thinking about doing this, just make sure you consider that um, and make sure that connectivity exists and is not going to make any of the uh, big, bad security folks at your company angry at you. <laughs> and another thing is uh, if you have a long latency between where the, where the virtual media is being hosted and the BMC, you may end up not being able to ramp up enough bandwidth to actually quickly boot the machine uh, because of the TCP window sizing. This is unfortunately something we've observed in the in the wild. All very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's sad because vMedia seems like the panacea in a lot of ways, but just like everything else, you're trading something off. And if you don't know what you're trading off, then uh, 
you got to think a little harder. So, so um, okay, so we had some stuff we we're going to talk about sharding and scaling. Do you want to keep this conversation going? Or, I mean, we're looking at about 28 minutes left. Do we want to move on to, to next stuff and then still have more open discussion at the end if there's a uh, more fun chat to have? Like we can speed through the sharding stuff, but I think that's interesting and folks should know that it's coming. I would say we could have a five, three, three, five minutes break and continue with scaling and return to any topics in open discussion if anything happens. But we also had like, we are more like one and more, more than 45 minutes late for the scaling discussion. Maybe some people came for that. So maybe we'll do it on a relatively quick, in a relatively quick way. Then we return to all questions, open discussion, or we, maybe it's we've had enough open discussion really. And, yeah, I mean, I say, I say, we let's let's hit the sharding stuff. Let's not like blow through it, but let's try to do it pretty pretty speedily. And then, what time we have left, we can re-engage discussion. Maybe that will create more discussion or not. But uh, all right, are we ready to have a chat about scaling? Ironic. Sure. Yeah, I'll let you uh, start with that. I'll be just clicking the slides when you tell me to. Jay, you okay? <laughs> As okay as someone can be expecting to hear things without their headphones in. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you take this. Uh, and I was just clicking through the slides. So oh, well, actually, we have some slides from Arne first, right? So just... yeah, go ahead. Then we can discuss sharding. Okay. Then we have a few things about MetaCube. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So, so I I put in a, a couple of slides uh, about about our scaling experience. So this this plot actually shows. This plot shows how we how we grew the aeronic deployment over the past like five years. As pointed out earlier, we started a little bit earlier, 2016, 2017, which is like cut off. Um, but you see how like this very steep um increases, these are usually new deliveries that are coming in. And in the beginning of 2021, you see this like rise from five thousand to like something like eight, eight and a half thousand nodes. This is actually the adoption. Um, where we pretty aggressively enrolled in production nodes. And then when it goes down, that's usually um, a retirement campaign where hardware was removed and then we get like new hardware in at some point. Uh, and at the very end, you also see a sharp drop below 7,500, but actually the nodes are down at the bottom. They just fell down to the, to the yellow bar. These are nodes that are switched off or like instances that are deleted actually to save some electricity. So they're still there. So the, the, the yellow block at the bottom actually belongs to the top. We're still um, around 9,000 nodes at the moment. So during this journey, there was actually quite some, as you can imagine, there were quite some things that we ran into. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned um, in, the, in the past hour. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I have listed some of them. So th there were various uh, issues that we had over the time. Um, for instance, with, with the databases. So whenever we started up our control plane and all the conductors connect to the database at the same time, uh, the, we had a thundering herd problem and ironic after, for instance, an upgrade could not really start because the database was overloading. And then uh, we basically had to like start them in a like more controlled way. This was fixed um, to a large degree by um, changing the way the database is accessed to lazy loading. Um, and you see on the graph how that how that helped. Um, but you still see that there's a very regular pattern. So when you start up by running and they're all synced because they start at the same time, they hit the database at the same time and you create this like very regular pattern. Um, and then the lower part, for instance, you see, if I remember correctly, this is actually an actual um upgrade full upgrade of ironic so you see i start usually this around 10 a.m and then things are down for a while while i do things and then I, at some point i think i'm ready and i start um so this is the thundering herd at the beginning this sharp peak at around where's that 11 a.m and then you see like the database activity so this is basically showing the database activity is much higher than it was before the upgrade so this is when you realize that actually you have forgotten to add some of the patches and you have to rebuild the software uh, because you forgot the lazy loading patch. So at, at two, I realized, no, early I realized, but at two, basically there's the, um, where like roll out the new software. And then later during the day, 
I stagger the the the, the startup of the conductor and it gets basically into like very quiet, relatively quiet area again. So database access is, is one of the um areas where a lot of work has gone into uh, with this lazy loading. I also Julia made like major contributions in order to improve the way we access the database and it was massively has become massively more efficient and, and scalable. One other thing that we struggle a lot with in other deployments as well is, is resource discovery. So whenever there's um, uh, an instance that's been deleted and a bare metal node becomes free, how long does it actually take until the system realizes? Ironic realizes, realizes relatively fast, but Nova is a different um, story. So conductor groups help there a lot. So conductor groups is basically grouping these nodes uh, with a controller. Um, we use conductor groups in order to do this to make um, our running more scalable, but this should be superseded by, by sharding. I guess uh, Jay will explain that in a second. Um, there, are th there are other things that you need to like bear in mind when like your deployment grows, which is the, the, the power status checking that our running does. So I did the math once for our deployment and there's like roughly a million calls to check the power per day. So that's quite a lot in a, in a data center. So there's some parallelism now that uh, was built into Ironic a couple of years ago where you can actually conf like, um, configure how many BMC calls should be done in, in parallel. So that, that helps a lot and you can also control the, the frequency. And then there, of course, there are API overloads. So for instance, when uh, um, there's like a lot of um, inspections happening at the same time you need to make sure that this is like properly scaled out um there's also the problem there was also the problem when the inspector downloaded the database so we added something which was also included upstream where there's an inspector election to like have a master inspector that basically is the one like synchronizing the databases um we had issues when we did active introspection because when we did this in order to update the inventory that I mentioned earlier uh, on, on a bunch of nodes, it was basically calling because they were in the same conductor group to the same API. And if you do this on 200 or 400 nodes at the same time, the API um, cannot handle that load. So we had to go through the load balancers in order to do this. Um, so there's a lot of like things that over time we needed to adapt. But at the moment, at least at our scale with roughly 10,000 nodes, um, we have no major scaling issues at the moment but this is mostly just say like this was quite a journey over the past couple of years um do i have another slide oh i do okay so this is basically the the conductor node conductor group setup like a sketch so at the very bottom you see the physical nodes and then we have um ironic controllers per conductor group so it's basically initially we started with all the a couple of thousand nodes and we had three controllers basically and then we had some uh, nova controllers on top and at some point we needed to um separate these a little bit and introduce conductor groups and we have um basically one ironic controller per conductor group managing um at most around 500 nodes you see this at the top some conductor groups are a little bit larger but 500 nodes is like a good compromise for us between um the amount of additional ironic controllers that we need and the time it needs to um, discover the resources so it's a compromise if you have more you can be quicker but you need to spend more virtual machines of course now there's a couple of things that we did in addition so you see on the very left side we have a special group which is the conductor group zero that doesn't have a nova controller because we don't create instances there um the nice thing about conductor groups is also that um, some of the configuration you can then do per conductor group and in our case we do fast track there so in order to onboard nodes we don't reboot them in between but we use fast track uh, in order to like onboard them clean them do the burn in without rebooting in between uh, and at some point when we're ready we move them to the conductor group where they actually switched off again so fast track is basically where you don't reboot or switch off um, after you've done something but keep the node running waiting for the next instructions and once they're ready we move them to the conductor group where they are actually uh, switched off and then are waiting for 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 the instantiation the other thing that we did if you look at the very right the, the leading group we sometimes have a leading group where we have where there's more activity we have more we can also add more conductors in order to handle increased load but this is basically how our setup look, looks like. We have, as I said, roughly 9,000 nodes and around 20 or so conductor groups to do this. But with sharding, that will become even better, I guess. 
Next slide is probably sharding now. Uh, let's actually go back yeah. and leave Sorry. that one and I'll talk about sharding over this one. So this is sort of an abuse of our conductor groups in some ways. Like what Arnie's doing with the different configurations is more what it's designed to reflect or maybe even physical locations. You could have a single um, ironic installation working across multiple data centers. But what it was not intended to be is a key for um, for less scalable components like Nova Compute to key off of. Um, I will say that there are an extremely large number of ironic deployments today using this type of setup where you have conductor groups in order to segment your nodes into smaller chunks that Nova Compute can handle better. Um, and sort of the main, and, and I don't want it to sound like a drag on Nova because it's not. Nova designed their components to scale to approximately the maximum number of nodes that can be on a hypervisor because that's that's what they deal in as hypervisors. And so when Ironic comes in and we you know have a single Ironic installation that has thousands or tens of thousands of nodes, that's just a level they never designed for. So how do we how do we make this work? How do we allow the functionality of conductor groups to still be there for people who need it for that config separation, for people who need it for that location separation, while also allowing us to do this? And, and this is where sharding comes in. So what we've done, and I don't have any specific slides about this, but uh talk about what we've done is we've added a key to the node called shard. This is a free form text field. You can you can name your shard Fido if you want. There's no there's no rule against what the naming convention is or anything like that. But the idea is um, we've also added support for querying nodes and ports by a given shard. So for services like Nova Compute or um, networking bare metals, another good example with ports instead of nodes that essentially operate on a pattern of give me all of the information from Ironic and then iterate over them. We're literally running into slowdowns that are caused by parsing gigantic JSON documents and the sort of things that Python are slow at. So by cutting those into more bite-sized pieces, um, we're going to be able to make those client services use the shards and work a little faster. And the cool thing about this is that this isn't just something that it can be useful for our tooling. So in Antelope, we hope to ship the support for this in Ironic. The support in Nova Compute and in Networking Bare Metal is scheduled for Bobcat. Um, but obviously, no guarantees. It gets done when it gets done. Um, but once we land this in Antelope, you can start assigning shards to your nodes. And the cool thing is, is you'll be able to then, if you would like, you can also limit your, um, your actual operations queries based on shards. Like I know when I've worked at hyperscale environments and we had to do something like in times for in nodes, that, that can be really painful when you have 10,000 nodes and you have 100,000 nodes. Like that gets, that gets really tough. So you're able to look at it. You're able to use those shards to maybe parallelize out your operations work as well. And so it, it's a minor thing just adding an arbitrary key that you can segment your nodes by, but uh, we think it'll have good impacts on the ecosystem. Um, the other thing we implemented there is just an endpoint that you can call and it'll give you a count back. It'll just tell you, here's the name of all your shards and here's how many nodes are in each to help you monitor and manage that. Um, and like I said, we'll have support for that in Ironic in Antelope. I would not expect any of our, um, any of our, clients we ship, such as Nova Compute or uh, um, Networking Bare Metal, to have that support until Bobcat or later. But it's a cool thing that's coming, and hopefully that'll um, free up people's environments to use conductor groups for conductor groupy things and not have to overload them to also shard. Um, I also know, I think this is one of like our most painful points. The, the, I, 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 I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tease it. The network, the Nova spec for this is still under review and there's a lot of cool things in it that'll make HA um, for Nova computes more clear cut and it'll also remove some of the races as well. So we're, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, shifting our model and Nova to look more like other stuff, but we'll talk about that at some future bare metal seg when that spec is actually approved. So I think, that's that's all there really is to say about sharding. I think you had a couple of things you wanted to talk about about with metal metal cubed, right, uh, Dimitri? Yeah, but I'll let people ask questions and provide comments first because I guess it's an exciting topic. 
uh, in the move to sharding, is there anything the operator needs to change uh, in his way? So the, I, I assume conductor groups still, will still be there. Do I need to do anything else with, for example, the node resource? Do I need to assign stuff to shards? Or this is a fully dynamic process in this case then? Um, so like, it'll be, it'll be um, the, there's no automatic shard assignment in Ironic. It is an attribute on a node. You set the node driver, you set the node shard, right? Like it's just one of the things you set on there. It's not going to be required. And if you don't operate a deployment at a large enough scale to care about or need sharding, you can ignore it exists, more or less. Like that field's just going to be dead to you. Um, for when we get to the point where we have support in clients for this stuff, where Nova Compute's ready to go, where Networking Bare Metal's ready to go, we're going to provide detailed operator documentation and migration for people who wish to adopt shards in that situation. But for Antelope, there's not really an action for you to take. If you are at scale and you go, gosh, I have this automated process that runs and it's slow because it has to iterate over my giant ironic cluster, then you'll be able to solve that for your problem by simply updating node.shard on all your nodes to some non-null value to separate them into different shards. Like this is literally as simple as it gets. It's node.shard, you set it via um, the client or an API call to any string value and that string value is a shard. Like there is no, there is no top level ironic object of a shard. You're never gonna call an API to create a shard. You just set node.shard and the rest is just magic. Like uh, under the covers, our V1 shard endpoint is literally a um, just a select out of the database of unique node dot shards in their count. So it's it's there's there's the the amount of fancy here is very little. We're just adding a key to the object that operators can set optionally and clients can consume optionally in order to give them a consistent subset of nodes to operate on. Is there a diminishing return on how small you should slice a shard? Oh, oh, certainly. Like, like there's going to be an infrastructure cost for shards um, when we do Nova Computes because each shard is going to need its own Nova Computer. Um, it, it's tough for me to talk about the full ramifications of operations for shards when only the ironic half of it is done right now. So, like, I don't want to tell you processes that are going to be a certain way when they're not set in stone yet, but um, there will be an infrastructure cost for each shard, almost certainly. Like, you're going okay. to have to run some separate stuff for that. Um, and the changes that we're proposing for Nova Compute are basically going to change us to where it's going to be more of a um, active-passive style failover for conductors instead of the clustered things um, where right now like multiple computes can provision a given ironic node um, that's going to be going away with sharding we're going to make it where um, you basically you know this nova compute handles these nodes it provisions them it manages them and if you want to be able to access those nodes if that nova compute comes down you will have to configure some sort of failover mechanism to like a cold or warm spare, something like that. Okay. Uh, Fedora posted a question. Is this scheme of conductor groups relevant to modern OpenStack version or can it be simplified? What scale numbers do you have for every service? And how do you use Prometheus for monitoring? Any common exporters or rote internal ones? So um, I would say that the graph here of conductor groups represents the current state of ironic art of how you would deploy a cluster. Um, you have conductor groups to help you scale with um, Nova computes um, and a bunch of physical nodes set up to each one. Like this is a this is a good modern ironic uh, open stack design. Uh, as far as scale numbers for each service. I think we have like two separate categories of services, right? There are OpenStack services that Ironic consumes that might be designed to scale to hypervisor levels. These are tools like um, Nova Compute. These are things like the Neutron Agent model that Networking Bare Metal implements because the idea is that they're never going to have to do for a given N 
larger than an N that's like a single hypervisor's worth of VNs. So those are only scaling into hundreds or maybe, you know, low thousands with some performance degradation. When you start talking about ironic services, we scale up a little bit better simply because we're able to utilize the hardware that we're provisioning on. The direct provisioning method means that most of the effort done to provision a node is done on the node, gives us a lot more freedom. So um, do, do we have a good nodes per conductor number? Like I would think, I, I have worked in environments that had as high as uh, seven or 8,000 nodes per conductor, but that was with very, very, very light deployment traffic and the power status loop disabled. So I, I think that's probably a bit high. Do, do y'all have any insight for that? Yeah, I would agree. So so I think we moved to up to 3,000 or something, and then we were really like struggling and we had um, like the, the power checking loop still enabled. Um, now what we have, as I said, we have like around 500 per conductor. And that seems to be working okay, uh, but we have not tried to like install 500 nodes on one conductor all exactly at the same time. Um, but but in general, this is like a number we are like pretty happy with. Yeah, that that is a, that is a good thing to be explicit about, right? Is that there are two knobs here that impact your scaling. It's how many nodes you have and how often you're churning them. Like if you have an environment where most people are provisioning a server, putting it into production and not touching it for two years, then you're going to be able to scale that number higher than other folks are simply because your conductors are not going to be doing as much. Exactly. Also, if you like, for instance, when we deploy, I know we get a delivery of a couple of thousand nodes that goes into batch computing and when you want to, you know that you want to deploy all at the same time is different from you get a couple of thousand nodes and then users are picking them up slow, slowly over the next year. Uh, that that is a different load profile. I, I see that Scott also uh, from G Research um, added something on the chat saying that they have around 1,000 node per conductor, so that's the same order of magnitude. Um, but they haven't tried to go like a lot higher than this. And then somewhere it says we have around 250 nodes per conductor. So it's it's yeah, it's it's up to 1,000 maybe. Seems like the consensus. And it's also like with, with the experience that, that I have. As I said earlier, the, the 500 that we use is more or less an arbitrary um, limit where we say, okay, this is a good compromise between the number of conductors that we would need. Each of these are each of these boxes are actually virtual machines um, versus the amount of time it needs in order to find all the resources because that like increases uh, linearly with the number of nodes that you have in a conductor group. So if you need to find your resources faster, you would probably have smaller conductor groups. Julia. One additional aspect to consider is uh, what driver you're using. If you're using Redfish, you're using native Python and hash sessions, most likely as long as you don't set it to basic authentication. Or if you're like using IPMI, then you, your, your scaling profile has to change dramatically and you have to tune your settings appropriately because that's a high CPU overhead to launch that process. Another yeah. thing I was going to comment, and this fits right in with what Julia was saying, is uh, is that when we say multiple conductors, you should not map that in your head to physical hardware. Small VMs, containers, even multiple instances on the same server, if it has sufficient cores, can be useful for this. Like, um, as long as you are not network bound on your conductors, which doesn't really happen now that the iSCSI driver is gone, there's no reason you can't run, you know, multiple conductors on a given piece of physical hardware. Um, I'm not sure I would go as high as one per core necessarily, but maybe one for every other core, something along that lines. It's not going to be a problem because it's sort of like I was saying with the sharding stuff. And a lot of these cases, our scaling limitation is straight up Python being slow at doing some of this stuff. And so getting it spread across more processes, more CPUs does a big difference. Well, there's a stupid issue that will prevent just having several conductors because we uh, only use host name to distinguish conductors. Uh, you can set that in the config file. I right, if, and if you have RabbitMQ, it's, it's even gonna work. It's not going to work for, for us with JSON or PC, though, because we use that for navigation. Okay. 
So containers yeah. then. Well, I had an idea that we had to take ports into account. So just make contact us addressed by host name colon port. I definitely had physical hardware running multiple container processes, but that must have been broken at some point then, which makes sense. I mean, it's not something we ever officially said we supported. Well, what, also... what... sorry. Okay, no, go ahead, Julia. What Dimitri's saying is it'll only work if you're using a message bus. Uh, if you have slightly different host names, if you're using JSON on RPC, uh, it's not going to magically work uh, because the host name, it'll try to connect to that. And if, if, if that has a unique IP address, then the world will be a happy place. But if it doesn't resolve a unique IP address, uh, it's not going to be able to connect to it. Yeah, there's also stuff you can optimize around the provisioning itself. We get it easy because, as I said, we don't have images. We don't use images at all, like instance images. Uh, if you, for example, if you want to optimize for maximum throughput of conductor, you can use raw images and make so they are they're not converted on conductor, they're just streamed directly. Or you can disable conversion and use QCAO images and convert them on the side of the node. There's, this, there's a lot of knobs in Ironic to tune if you want to optimize the number of nodes per conductor. I actually wonder, I haven't I haven't thought about this much, but I wonder how our alternate drivers scale um, compared to our image-based ones, right? Because we have a kickstart driver now, we have the RAM disk driver, um, and I haven't heard much from folks who are trying to scale that up. Um, Looking at how much right the on. conductor is involved, I would almost think they, they're probably pretty close for kickstart and maybe RAM disk is a little easier. RAM disk is very easy. Um, I think our folks who are using RAM disk deploy, so this live ISO deploy metal cube terms, they are going into thousands pretty easily with one conductor. We only have one. Yeah, honestly, like one thing, and I, I, Again, understand your trade-offs before you do this, but if you really have a need to scale a conductor crazy high, turn off your power status loop and just make sure that power controls are done through Ironix API or tune the power status loop to be much less frequent than it currently is because that is one of the big uh, big taxes. But uh, I think, I think did, we, did we cover all the stuff you were asking about, Fedor? We kind of just have been talking about scaling. We might just want to talk about the metal three thing and move on to the big yes that's scaling. perfect yeah <laughs> thank you uh i have one more small question about nova compute uh, service for ironic uh does it okay to use one nova compute uh, for one set of ironic conductor with 500 nodes for example or nova compute uh, should manage uh, more nodes or less i would not go above 500 personally but it's all a matter of how much you're churning those nodes, what your tolerance is for failure, and what your tolerance is for slowdowns. Um, the, the weird thing about the way Nova Compute scale today is that sometimes, like, there are certain aspects to running a Nova Compute without sharding and without conductor groups. If you're just running it, running it with a pretty plain Jane Ironic, then there are pieces that... Uh, all of those conduct all of those computes have to touch all of your nodes at startup to gather inventory. So that's kind of getting to the heart of why sharding exists at all. Is that at a certain point, if you get a single conductor group, or like I said, an ironic with no conductor groups scaled to a certain size, there's just no way to get enough Nova compute capacity to it. Um, I've even seen situations where the ironic was scaled up so large that a restart of Nova compute services would literally take the better part of a day because it was having to fetch um, so many nodes, parse them, update the database, and then do that in times for in Nova compute processes. And it is, uh, it, it's pretty miserable at, at high scale before conductor groups existed and uh, before sharding, it was extremely miserable. So, uh, so I, that, that's part of why I'm really excited about sharding. When I operated Ironic, I felt all that pain constantly. And so I'm very excited to have a first class way to get rid of it. 
I put this in chat, I'll just chime in. One of the huge things in that time was actually Nova trying to re reattach all the networking. And we have since fixed that bug. And I think that that fix is in fact ported all the uh, way down. I had that patch for the story I just told. We had that patch downstream oh. for that. It was still that bad. But you had, a, you had one of the largest environments in the planet. I, for sure. For sure. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> yeah, are we done with this topic? Because I, I had a few small things, but maybe not so exciting. And more like... So things I've got are more like questions and really answers or exciting stuff to tell people. But I, I think I touched upon some PDGs, but maybe people have ideas or, you know, as an OpenStack setting, there are many conductors. Each is hand, each node is handling by exactly one, and this exactly one conductor has all the artifacts belonging to this node locally, like its pixie settings, its images, you know, stuff. We, you, we, <laughs> not you, the shared. Yeah, right, right. So yeah, let me start with a problem statement. Uh, we use Neutron to tell the node that you have to go after the HCP boot from this conductor, not like any other, which is cool, fine. Standalone setting, no neutron. We have DHCP static. Or anyways, there's no way for Ironic to influence that. So my struggle with that is how do we direct the node at the right conductor? Or because Jay is saying no shared directory, please, right? It was like a first idea, shared directory, but I feel like I have a gut feeling it's a bad idea. It's 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 bad for a couple of reasons. And uh <laughs> that that same environment was using a shared directory between conductors. I think there's actually may have been like upstream public talk about that from people who worked there. So please do do find that because I'm I'm gonna talk in riddles. <laughs> we um we were running that with a shared directory, and there's a couple of things about it. First is we had to carry a ton of uh, of patches to make this even reasonable because of things like um, local caches, like each conductor wanting to keep its own local cache in the shared dir. Um, and what we also saw was we had a bug in that environment, which... I never found a smoking gun. And if you've ever worked with NT NFS hangs, you sort of know why, where we would have nodes that would just, in the middle of a deployment, it would just deadlock the entire conductor thread. And uh, it, it was it was literally just silent. It's like it no longer existed. We wouldn't get a failure state. None of the um, None of our restoration loops would catch it because it was still locked as if it was being actively worked on. The absolute only way to recover this node was to restart the conductor that it was running on, which was extremely disruptive. Um, so I don't think that's the solution. I can tell you about how we solved it at Rackspace, which has a different set of trade-offs. Um, we use static addressing for everything. So what we did was we hard-coded Ironic to point to a dedicated Pixie server, or in your case, you could use in Pixie servers. It doesn't matter. Um, and we basically, in the same process we used to get nodes into Ironic, we had it also generate DHCPD configs over here as well with the MAC addresses and the IP addresses specified. And when you're able to do that, that lets you do fun things like... Uh, specifically based on a given node booted in a different RAM disk and things like that, all out of band. Um, the downside for that for us was we essentially had three private networks, a provisioning, a rescue, and a cleaning that all were statically addressed ahead of time. Now, I mean, RFC 1918 addresses are cheap, so that may not be a big deal, but it certainly was not elegant. It worked, but it was, it was clunky. So, like, those are sort of two two directions you could use to attack that. Personally, I've always thought the best way to approach this, if we did it in Ironic properly, yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. Julia stole it. She stole it right out of my mouth with her chat um, of that, the conductor being able to tell all the other conductors set up Pixie for this node, right? Like, and, and that might help you a little bit. And that sort of support would have also solved the use case that I had downstream at previous job that was patched. 
Uh, can you tell me what an RWX PVC is, please, Samuel? Is that so like it's, a um, uh, no, it's a no, <laughs> no, it's a persistent volume claim in Kubernetes. So it's basically a, a piece of file storage. Um, and RWX just means the uh, it's a read write many. So you have it's basically a, a flat NFS share between all the containers which use basically the same directory. So it's like a share, but uh, it's abstracted through Kubernetes, whatever um, storage driver you use. And uh, therefore, uh, it's attached to the containers using this method, basically. So, and therefore, it's basically a in the container, it looks like a shared directory between um, all the pods you want to attach it to, as long as your storage provider or storage driver is uh, able to do that. I wonder if the fact it's abstracted means you're less likely to hit like NFS silliness. Because NFS is, I, I've never worked in an environment that had an NFS set up that did not just occasionally fail in a really gross way that usually locked the underlying process. So it makes me wonder if like the fact that Kubernetes is doing some coordination here has a meaningful impact on how stable it is. It's it's also, I think, the vendor-specific driver. So we don't use like a plain NFS driver. So we use a vendor-specific driver for, in our case, a NetApp. And this is very well written in my case. Um, it's running now since two and a half years in this setup. And so far, this uh, shared file system, let's say, uh, abstracted uh, between all these containers works really well. But I, I second that. The moment it breaks, hell, let's loose. But so far, it didn't break. It doesn't surprise me that it works much better with an actual bespoke uh, NAS. And whereas the environment I was talking about, we're literally talking about just one of the conductors was a server and all the rest were clients. So not not some sort of high advantage uh, NFS. Plus, I'm not sure we had anyone who was an NFS expert in there, which... Um, I think we were all pretty grateful for at the time that none of us had to be NFS experts. So. <laughs> that's that's interesting. That's that is uh that's very interesting. I'm trying to think of other ways to solve this. Like I think the um I really like the idea of the conductors being able to tell the other conductors to set up Pixie or even just like an iPixie file, which would chain load to the correct conductor or something like that. Like, there's no reason we should be using external coordination for something like this when Ironic specifically has more information about how to do it, and the actual action needing needed to be taken is much, much, much lower. In fact... Oh, I like the idea of this custom iPixie file. We had a spec by Pavlo who was like about generating this iPixie scripts on fly instead of recaching them. And yeah, that's interesting. That requires some coding, but that's that's pretty interesting. I thought I thought of that uh, original spec of the dynamic generation as well. I my my worry, honestly in doing that is largely going to be the operational impact of getting people to do it because we were talking about it then as an endpoint on the API, which means people have to do API filtering if they want to do public access to the API. So it's sort of getting like you really have to know ironic and how to configure it to be a secure ironic deployment, which could be problematic. And also I think the other problem that exists is not everyone just uses iPixie. Uh, some people use Grub. Uh, some people need Grub and the uh, secure boot functionality. So that's another thing to consider is maybe in some cases, depending on the driver, we'd have to go ahead and set up a copy of the config uh, as appropriately as possible so that everything will boot. And that's almost a driver, a boot driver interface dependent understanding. Yeah, that is. Can you chain load into Grub? I guess that doesn't matter because if someone is choosing to use Grub, we can't necessarily assume that their hardware would support some other option for essentially a Pixie three hundred one redirect. Yeah. Um, so the the challenge with Grub is you 
cannot say you cannot chain load and uh, fall back. You can chain, so uh, but it's it's generally the people when people use grub they need the signed uh, shim binary in in the process so that they can not lose the uh, security state on the uh, TPM. We can dive deep into the, the topic of secure booting machines, but it, it, it's a case that some people need to do. And in the case of like ARM hardware, your only real easy quick direct option is Grub. Hypixie is not efficient distributed uh, in most distributions for ARM by default. I'll fix it in Gentoo if you fix it in Red Hat. I may have already convinced someone to fix it in Red Hat, actually. Oh, crap. I <laughs> gotta do it in <laughs> Good luck. It, there, these are some, some of these things are things we've had to have discussions for a very long time. So I'm looking at our package list for OpenShift Ironic Image, and we definitely have a package called iPixiboot EMG's Arch64 installed. So maybe you don't need to convince people because apparently that's a thing. Apparently, no, we stole I, it in our I, images. I uh, had a chat with the, the folks that maintained that about two years ago or three years ago. Like, you know, this is a use case. You know you're going to need it. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's a thing in row nine, I think, or somewhere in your version of row. And Jay has determined he's off the hook. <laughs> Yay, the world has progressed. It's, it's, uh, it's it's easy to make those sort of promises with Gen 2 because like if Gen 2 doesn't have a package for it, it probably doesn't exist. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll package it. You just gotta find the package that already exists. Uh, but that's 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 interesting. And like I think um I don't know, it's um it I I would be interested to to learn more about how uh, people running ironic on arm and to provision arm is succeeding because that's uh that's interesting to me personally but uh we probably do need to move on. We should probably hold a session on that and I know I have the business card for the people to email. All right, so it sounds like uh if we're coming to a close, it looks like Julia just volunteered to do our um, Q2 bare metal SIG presentation. That was nice. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> Great. I haven't even just decided the date, but we already have topics. That's awesome. But I guess if anybody has some wrapping up questions, comments on scaling on any other topic, then we have a few more minutes until 30 minutes exact. So there is... Um... And some people might feel this is a little controversial, but there is a couple different things going on uh, from my point of view. One is we do want to try and expose better metrics out of the conductor, uh, and we're kind of working on that. So, like you can have a, you can actually understand how many times the call is getting occurring inside the conductor through Prometheus. That's a work in progress. I'm hoping uh, in the next, sometime within this next year, it's in a release. Um, he was working on some functionality to uh, more safely release the load, the workload of, that the conductor is working on, so that we don't have to kill jobs or active in process deployments, um, which I think is really cool and I think is way past due. <laughs> um, and there was another thing that occurred to me that I should mention, and now I've blanked on it and I will never remember it, most likely. While Julia is trying to, to find her lost thought, I'll say generally. It should be pretty obvious if you've been here the whole time that we love having these kind of discussions. Uh, we're all passionate about this stuff. We've all been working on it for years and years. Um, so if you have these sort of questions, don't save them for a bare metal SIG. Come hang out in IRC. Come ask on the, the channel. I even I even plug uh, on my YouTube channel, um, Jay of Doom. I do two times a week. I do a one-hour office hour session. And... If you have questions like this, you can bring them to me. If I don't know the answer, we'll figure it out together. Um, like this is, uh, I enjoy the community. And uh, for those of you who've been here and been interacting, like we really do appreciate it because uh, 
it's uh it's a lot nicer than releasing software to a black hole of silence so thank you for being around please stick around hang out uh with the community and such i mean a lot of you already are but maybe there's one or two who aren't and if so we can we can rope you then be nice to have you around yeah another request before we close uh that's our first instance of a meetup in this format. Please let me know, or Jay, or Arne, if you're afraid of me, uh, how well it go, what suggestions you have, if it was useful for you or not. It was more useful than previous meetings or less useful if you wanted us to change something because we're happy to hear your feedback. And I would be very unhe unhappy to not hear any feedback because I put a bit of effort into organizing this. So, yeah. Let me know how much you hated it or loved it or you know what we should change the next time. Cool, and thank you. you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to wrap up, so go ahead, you. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, and I don't remember what I was thinking. It has escaped me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm willing to hang out and talking questions with folks uh but i think we'll get samuels and then maybe cut the reporting off and then if people want to hang out you know my zoom room you're wel we're welcome to hang out for as long as we want but uh maybe let people be free to do their day job if they've got to do that but samuel was asking uh is there specific documentation on what an operator needs to adjust if they want to run a multi-arch deployment um yeah i think that is operated uh, uh documented it's like a cpu underscore arch in node extra something like that it is, and you have to set some configuration parameters. Uh, I actually responded to the same question on the Discuss mailing list, uh, I think, last week. Well, I will uh, find that response and link it. it. That sounds good. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I also made some thoughts of what I need to do, like cross-compile, IPC, and all that stuff. But um, I would just, before I start, because I don't have the servers yet, I would have just maybe if there was someone who already has that information, I could just cross check if I miss some hilariously obvious step currently, like, oh, you need to do also if you want to deploy an, an image, then later on you need to have that image as an Arch64, whatever. And uh, that was just the idea. But if you can find that link, because I think my OpenStack mailing list stuff is currently not working with my company account. Um, if you would find that link, that would be. Yeah, I already, really I already dropped it in chat. And please, like, uh, ask perfect. those questions ahead of time because I'll tell you, I was the docs liaison a little bit. I tried really hard to make Ironic Docs better, but it's such a complex project that it's incredibly hard to make the docs well-organized and easy to find stuff. And uh, I think the price we have to pay for being bad at organizing docs is that sometimes we're an index for those docs. So that's okay. Ask those questions. We'll get answers for them. Uh, like... Like, we're not upset that you asked a question that someone asked a week ago. It's it's kind of our fault that the docs are not well organized. So that's the price we gotta pay. We're better at automating hardware than right than uh, organizing docs. So I I completely agree. And we still follow the, the overall community doc guidelines, which makes things a little com complicated. And when you're focusing on one area and you look at the other. Um I think one of the things that I've received feedback is those that know to set the parameters based upon the box. Usually, as long as they build their own iPixie or have an iPixie uh, loader that they can use, that just works. Uh, that's at least the feedback I've been getting. But uh, if you have questions, we can rope in some folks uh, who actually work for the chip designers uh, who also use Ironic, which can be helpful. That sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, I would have just a second quicker question. Is the for the ironic metrics exporter for Prometheus? Uh, I currently uh, know the one which just exposed the in, uh, the uh, like the metrics for the machines, um, and now the ones uh, with the which will be uh, um, added to is the one for the internal metrics of like the ironic components. Will there be a mode to just like it for the uh, to just run it for the internal components, or is it always the full package? So the intent is the full is the full package, but the patch is still a work in progress with the, the services. Uh, we could probably make it optional, or make it uh, such that you can choose. Um, and one one thing that I think we haven't spent well, I haven't spent too much time on is thinking about 
API impact if you want to get those metrics as well. Um, the me methods are labeled, uh, so they will get picked up. It's just I'm not sure by default uh, there's an easy way for to that so that to be exported. And we want to export it all at one all in one run, so it gets a little complicated as well. But we can take that offline and discuss it further. Okay, thanks. That sounds good. I'm going to stop our recording now.